My name is Myrtle Clark, and I'll be moderating this, this panel today. I'm from South Africa. As most of you know, I'm one half of the Dacha couple. In 2010, we sued our government uh, on charges of enacting unlawful laws, and since then, we've been fighting to change the law. We managed to achieve um, legalization for private use and cultiva cultivation in private spaces in September this year. So we are stuck in the middle of that place between being a movement and being a business and being an industry. So South Africa is in quite an interesting place. And I'm very uh, privileged to be here today and to be on this panel with my amazing sisters. And we've decided instead of introducing each other, we're each just going to introduce ourselves and then we'll carry on. Hello, my name is Crystal Ortiz, and I'm here from representing the United States of America. I serve on the board of the International Cannabis Farmers Association, which is a group of farmers, and our, um, our uh, mission statement is to empower traditional cannabis farmers through education, advocacy, and research. And I also serve as the co-chair of a women's economic development think tank called Women Cultivating Community. And we work together, we meet monthly, and we have been working together in helping navigate that tough space between a movement and a community and an industry and a marketplace. And so we um, share ideas, we share resources, we share things that we need to help each other be successful. And it's really um, been empowering to be in that group with women and um, because a lot of them would be seen as maybe competitors, but instead we work together and create a community. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you. My name is Daniela Creer. I am founder and president of the Nomad Institute. Uh, we are based in Germany. Uh, before, I uh, worked a lot of years in Latin America. But now we are uh, making research, multidisciplinary research about human rights and science. And drug policy is one of our pillars. And um, we think it's very important to make researchers um, uh, multidisciplinary so we can have a bigger picture of the situation with cannabis too. Um, we made researches about women and cannabis and uh, others want... <laughs> Sorry. Welcome. Um, and yeah, so I am happy to be here and I am grateful for all people who are possible this uh, meeting so we can uh, meet each other and uh, see uh, to the future, look to the future, and see what can we do together, because we recognize we need to do things together. So that's very important. That's why I'm here, and I hope we can go give impulses to um, this future works. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Hi, Hi. Patty. Hello. I get you and your baby. Sorry, I had <laughs> responsibilities. Oh. <laughs> uh, what? Introduce yourself. Okay, um, I'm Patricia Miguet. I'm from Catalonia, from Spain. Um, I'm a cannabis woman. I'm a cannabis mother. Um, I'm very glad to be here. Um, I'm presenting my organization, or the organization where I collaborate, that it's called REMA. It's the, let's see if I, well, Red Estatal Antiprohibicionista, Red Estatal de Mujeres Antiprohibicionistas en Materia de las Drogas. It's like complicated to translate. <laughs> um, sorry. Uy, uy, uy. Shh. Sorry. Um, don't get so excited, Mom. Just trying to remain calm. <laughs> um, no. no. No, please, it was really nice now. Hi. Um, today I'm here to present our project. Uh, it all started uh, with cannabis, uh, but now it has developed. So we, uh, maybe we can have a discussion later on and I can explain what. Yes, are the of roles course. Of We're going to give you a, a great opportunity to tell us all about what you're working on. I want to thank all of these lovely ladies for being here, but I want to introduce to the audience exactly what it is we are doing here. 
uh, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its 17 Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, uh, were adopted by world leaders in 2015. These replaced the Millennium Development Goals, if you remember that, when we were heading into Y2K. Um, they embody a roadmap to, prog to progress that is sustainable and leaves no one behind. Gender equality is absolutely central to meeting any of the sustainable development goals because women and girls represent half of the world's population. And this means that we have half of the potential possible uh, in the world. And, and still today, even though we represent 50%, we still face grave gender inequality. Uh, and this is absolutely stagnating social progress. When we think of gender equality, what do we think about? Do we associate this to women living in poverty? Or do we only think about women not getting as much money as their counterpart male colleagues? Um, one of the most pressing issues facing women today in the world is lack. Lack of financial resources, lack of food and therefore proper nutrition, lack of access to health care or reproductive care. Um, in some countries, girls still lack access to education. Many women around the world um, participate in unpaid work. 80% um, of farming is done by women. 13% of women own land in the world. So how are we ever going to reach equality in gender if we don't have women who own their properties? How are we going to ever reach this uh, elevation of poverty and nutrition if they're always paying rent or always chasing raw materials from somebody else? So these are some of the questions we want to you know, consider in these next 11 years as we address these 2030. Um, and, and, but we're not here today to solve all of these far-reaching problems, but we're here today to discuss how the blossoming cannabis industry, and specifically females in this movement, can contribute solutions um, to the global problems facing women today. So I hope we have an engaging conversation about what your organizations do and how we can help uh, elevate and transform this world into a brighter world. So, as women, we believe that each and every one of us in the cannabis world is acutely aware of the challenges facing us uh, every single day in this often male-dominated world. The first uh, cannabis conference that I ever went to was part of Spanibus in Spain a number of years ago. And there was a large panel of eminent experts, and there was one woman on that panel. And when she stood up, she said, I would like to thank the organizers for making me the token woman on the panel. And that was, I think, five or six years ago. And we, it's certainly good to see women represented more and more uh, in the cannabis world. We see women's associations springing up all over the world. We see women's cannabis magazines, uh, women-owned companies, um, thousands and thousands of women's cooperatives. So it is changing, but how can we speed up this process and how can we raise the profile of, of women in the, in the cannabis industry? So I just prepared two questions um, to, spark the, to spark the conversation. The first one is, if all legal obstacles were to be removed from a group of women in, for a group of women in your country to form a cannabis cooperative, a business, starting tomorrow, what would be your advice on where to start or how to uh, adapt their existing cannabis business to this new legal 
framework to the new legal environment. Because I think as particularly poor and rural people, and I speak for South Africa, um, we've just achieved decriminalization. We're probably two, three years away from full legalization. But a lot of women who have been used to working in the underground don't even know where to start. Because legalization has happened up here, but they are working down here in the underground. How do we bring these existing women up into the light? That's my first question. And my second question is, sometimes the cannabis industry is not about cannabis. It needs to be broadened to include the support industries. And I believe that this is a, a, a crucial area where women can play a role. For example, so Patty has her baby here today. Who, when Patty is busy working, who is going to look after her baby? So childcare can be one of the support industries of the cannabis industry. And often, all we do is talk about the weed. And the support industries are really important. And where, in your experience, have you seen a support industry that could really help women to prosper and and flourish. So those are the two questions. The first one is where, would, where do you start to make your business legal, your co-op? And the second one is what about the support industries? So maybe we start with Crystal. Okay, sure. <clears throat> um, I feel like that question is right where we are right now with the WCC group that I work with is that we did just get legalization in California in for adult use, and we've had medical for a while, but uh, the regulatory package, the regulatory framework is very difficult for the producers who existed before. For new people who can secure a parcel that has funding and can do what they need to do from a corporate perspective, the sky's the limit. But for the people who existed before, who've been making medicine, who've been making topicals and salves and teas and carrying this spirit of the momentum and creating this movement, um, it's been really difficult to meet the high threshold set by the regulators. And so one of the answers to that question that has come out of our group has been working together. And you did say a, a cooperative, a women's cooperative. So for manufactured goods, so value-added products, women notoriously make crafts and are value-added product people also. And so the idea that each one of these 12 women or 10 women that make their individual products would need to invest in a multi-hundred thousand dollar build out and insurance and security requirements and all of those things was destined to destroy the potential of their businesses. And so the idea that we could come together and create a system or a shared facility, a manufactured facility that has different spaces that is independently run by the individual businesses helped them now share that cost by eight or by 10 or by 12 or however many people were in that facility. And so our next job was to then get the regulators to understand how important it was to our community that we have these shared manufacturing facilities and these shared use facilities. What they were imagining when they prohibited it in the regulations was that it would be this round the clock, people coming in, making products, leaving, and they would never be able to track and trace that. And so what we had to do was we had to create a concept and show how a cooperative manufacturing space could look with distribution and potentially um, micro businesses on the same property so that those concerns that the regulators had were not so important. And so then the manu we could come in as women as if it were our home kitchen, make our products that we needed to make, and then check them into the distribution facility or the manufacturing facility when we left so that they were track and trace, they were safe and secured, and that they never left the, the closed loop system. And so we spent uh, the greater part of a year and a half developing this idea of this model and even doing the brass tax, the business financials, and then sharing this model with other regions and saying, hey, you can take this and you need this in your community because if you build it, they will come. I promise these women exist in your community that need this space to continue their products. And so that's the one way that we answered, or trying to answer that question, and it really comes down to just working together. No, 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 
Yeah, in, in Germany we have a women's network too. It's Canafem Network. I'm part of the organizing group. And it's very difficult. We are, we are in a process uh, too uh, to organize a cooperative, but it's not so easy uh, because the children, because a lot of uh, other things uh, there are to do. And I think um, the most important for the network in Germany is now to um, um, organize itself and uh, remove that obstacles uh, to um, uh, work together. And we are uh, at the moment in the process of uh, think about this concept, how will we um, communicate our, um, our mission, our goals, uh, because the, um, I think the most important thing is that the women um, of this group, uh, we say we want uh, to go into the industry or in the kind of business. Um, I'm not from the business uh, line, uh, but uh, this um, it's a um, very important thing because um, uh, um, how can I say it? Um, apologize for my English. <laughs> um, that. Um, we must find um, um, a form how we can uh, speak about business, but not, but not only about money. Yeah, not, it's not only about money. It's about uh, passion, and it's about healthcare, and it's about uh, things would have to do with the, uh, with the environment and with the with people. So, and um, I think holistic economy is one of the concepts what we are um, thinking about. And it's a long process because it's not only, oh, uh, drink a coffee, and then we decided, no. <laughs> um, so it's, um, yeah, that's, um, I think that's important. And um, yeah, the social responsibility, I think it's another uh, important point. And th I think the most, um, the, the biggest, um, uh, problem in Germany for this network of women are the resources. So uh, it's it's crazy, but we need resources. Th that's a problem. Yeah. So we have a lot of uh, um, power and a lot of people who are working, a lot of women. But the problem are the resources. So we are waiting and we are open uh, for um, uh, work together and encourage and empower these women who are. Um, beginning in this thema with the cannabis too. Uh, well, uh, Rema, or oh, well, it, Rema started as cannabis woman. No, it was a first uh, in 2016. Some friends that are all of, all of us are vinculated in some way to. Uh, drug policies. It's not only about cannabis. Some people were uh, anthropologists, psychologists, uh, um, doctors, uh, activists. No, we were like a multi-pluridisciplinary group, uh, but we were all friends. So at some point we said like, um, we are a lot of women getting on together. Uh, let's try and see if we make like a meeting point, what happens, no? So my answer for the first question is spontaneously and due to a necessity of really finding uh, your place as woman in a cannabis ambit, but at the end it was much bigger, no? Um, we did the meeting and at the end we had nearly 100 women coming to the to to the meeting um, more than seven countries represented and it was amazing you know at the beginning we we focused it uh, on cannabis but even the purposes that the conclusions that we had from that day you no know, were that we had like three work lines you no know, three big work lines to to continue the work that it was done we ha we went out of the meeting having a mission you no know, that it was like creating an association um, I could say many things, but I believe that the important thing is the transformation that the agrupation had. It began with Encuentro de Mujeres Canábicas, and it finished being, uh, um, how you call it, uh, an umbrella for many uh, uh, women associations that 
many of them are related to cannabis, but at the end also we have now uh, another aggravations coming from uh, other drugs, no? Women that uh, have violence in the streets and they have done like this association to be together and make like a, a cooperative life, not, not economy, but life, no? Um, so the important thing is like, we started thinking that would be an organization with hundreds of members, no? But at the end, the, the social networks uh, made like that instead of being woman paying a fee and being, I'm from the association, it was more like from the herd, no? Women that are cannabis women, that they have doubts and that they want to solve it, but because there is no information on the networks, because there is not easy going with mothers, what happens with mothers if they take cannabis, what happens, or any drugs, no? Um, so at the end, the work lines of the first meeting, that one of them was um, sexual reproduction, mothers, uh, what happens with health and cannabis, women, no? The second was cosification, how the use of the image of the woman is done in the cannabis sphere, no? In the fairs, I don't know if many people from here have been to Spanabis, but years ago, uh, you had loads of places, uh, of stands with women in bikinis uh, in in March, really cold, <laughs> uh, <laughs> just selling seeds. Uh, and thanks to cannabis woman that we did a, a speech, no, or we did a manifestation. Uh, nowadays, only the uh, companies that come from outside that they are new, they they bring hostesses. But now you see that the sphere has changed. So. Uh, without resources, because resources at the end are the big handicap, no? It's like very difficult. We have started many projects to get money for the association. We do it, but it's a big effort. And the compatibility of being mothers, of being workers, because at the end, anyone uh, gets paid in the, in, in, in the network, no? So getting the, com the, the combination of your own time with the work time or the activism time, it's like really complicated. Uh, what we are doing nowadays is like, we are not expecting to be 100 members, but we are like a thousand member network. Uh, everyone in Spain, or at least loads of women that use cannabis know Mujeres Canabicas. They start to know Rema. Uh, we have tried to start uh, an online shop of products about ourselves and see if we can uh, look for products in the cannabis industry thought for women and see if there we can get something but it's so complicated at the end and it's not only the point of money because yes not having money it's really makes it really difficult but at the end it's the time that the woman uh, can dedicate to this, being mothers being workers uh, being no a lot of stuff so it's like the key point of the association. <laughs> These are all fabulous incubated programs dedicated to women um, who are at this moment free in their communities to be with their families and children. Um, but I want to I want to come back to a, a pretty somber point. Uh, the majority of of women in prison worldwide are there for nonviolent drug related offenses, including charges involving cannabis, oftentimes for transporting the drugs, because uh, you know they're they're impoverished, they're easily um, brought into an illicit trade. Um, but the fact that women predominantly in the, in the prison population are there for nonviolent offenses clearly further emphasizes the fact to change drug policy. Again, as we're, as we're in this space, we, we see that um, large corporations are able to produce, sell, distribute um, cannabis while, while it's still prohibited by the drug treaties. So this is, a, this is a really bizarre kind of paradigm. And what we have in the midst of that legalization and traded stocks are women still imprisoned 
for the very same thing that is now being traded as a commodity, um, sometimes to the tune of $6,000 a kilo. Um, so as we look at this, the majority of, of women in prison are mothers, which means we have devastated and broken families. So what, what would we ask of the cannabis industry as they develop this moving forward to empowering women in businesses that aren't controlled by women? How can we engage this large industrialization that we're seeing um, to embrace women and recognize that we are very powerful contributors to a well-balanced society and our children don't deserve to be taken away from us? And how do we address the plight of women still imprisoned for a substance that now is being legalized and traded worldwide? It's a tall order, huh? <laughs> That's a really heavy question. Um, the answer, I think, isn't so simple, but I think that we're all working on it independently by being here on a stage as a woman and as a mother and taking that leap and talking about cannabis justice and social justice and, and holding these women that are held in captivity for this in our mind's eye when we do the work and recognize to put the fear aside and step forward because as mothers and as women, it is our job to educate and to teach and to make sure that we don't leave one another behind. I don't really have a lot of history about the other nations and their role in how this came to be, that women became um, so, dis you know, so imprisoned by the drug war. But I know in the United States between like 1987 and 1993, they implemented these really strong zero tolerance and these mandatory minimum policies. And when they in implemented these federal mandatory minimums, um, it meant that the girlfriend that lived at the house, the wife, anyone who was involved where the drug trafficking was happening was automatically guilty, even if they didn't know the contacts or any of those other things. And then in 93, they implemented the um, conspiracy rules, which made it even stronger. And so that's where the majority of the women in the United States got caught up with big federal charges and with long prison sentences because... Um, they oftentimes weren't high up in the drug ring or in the criminal behavior, but they were in the homestead and, you know, around when it was happening, but they didn't have the proper information to be the informants, which is what would get the men off. And so um, a lot of women ended up being ensnared in that system in the United States. And, you know, I can't really have this conversation about women without also recognizing that um, black and brown people in the United States are definitely suffering the um, injustice even deeper, you know, then we can just keep going further with the, the problems with that system. And so I think first just recognizing, learning, and looking, how did this happen, why did this happen, and how can we dismantle that? And second, um, pushing for policy change and social justice change and pushing for um, things to be better in our communities. Right. Thank you, thank you for that. And it's interesting, Crystal, that you, you only have that American California perspective, but we have an expert in human rights uh, sitting beside you. And so she, I think, can spend a few minutes talking about how, that's, how this type of policy has affected women in Latin America and the Caribbean. Yep. Oh, yes. <laughs> Um, so, uh, uh, on the one side, uh, I want to mention that uh, in Germany we are starting um, uh, um, research about uh, women and cannabis because we want to show this evolution from um, um, criminalization to citizen empowerment. Yeah, this evolution from uh, women we want to show in this um, in this research. And in Latin America, it's horror. When I think what I saw in Latin America, it's horror. So I think, um, yeah, it's, um, it's not only about the business, it's not only <laughs> about the money, it's about a lot, a lot of people who are suffering, not only because they not have medicine, because they have all these uh, obstacles, because the law and the international um, treaties. So, um, 
Um, sometimes when I speak about the things what I see, I feel um, sensationalist. I, uh, so it's, it's very hard for me to speak about that. Um, but I think in Latin America, there's no one family who has not one issue, problem with the law, with this drug policy, pro uh, the prohibition of cannabis. Um, so I think uh, we must push to um, uh, change this uh, for all these women. It's uh, incredible to uh, uh, think about the situation, how many women and poor women are in the jails in Latin America uh, because uh, in a lot of cases they are um, obligated to work on this on this business too, so we don't forget these women. Yeah, so it's very important that we make um, uh, a big network to um, uh, put impulses in all these uh, themas because it's a big, big issue, not only one or the other. And the uh, the thing with the regions is only uh, it's too uh, important because uh, each region has other problems with cannabis. So uh, we can empower each other and with these networks uh, work together and see, okay, in this region this uh, uh, could uh, be uh, good for us and in other regions are other problems. So I think we can focus on these um, issues and um, change um, 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 expertise and experience uh, to uh, move forward and open more ways uh, for this. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, what I know from uh, in, in Spain, we we don't we don't well one, we can say that it's good, but it has like other bad things. We we don't have incarceration uh, any about. It's like really difficult to go on jail about drugs or about cannabis, no? You have to have dealt with really big quantities or other substances. It must be another level, no? What the, the, the problem and at the end it affects to the local family and to the woman, what, what we have is like uh, the government has done uh, from the drug policies uh, an economic machine. Instead of going to jail, that it costs money to the government to sustain you, what they do is that they find you. They have done, uh, or they have done, they have converted cannabis in a way of getting loads of money. So as I told this morning, uh, only for having in your pocket weed or only for being smoking on the on the way, it's like 600 euro, no? So. Uh, imagine who are the people or, that are consuming in the streets, poor people or youngers. <laughs> also, there, there are other cases and many of us have been fined to smoke, but it's another movement, no, it's a cannabis movement and it's much easier to be focused on that. But what happens if a younger is being caught smoking? One, twice or three, no? The first time, so it's 600. The second time, I believe it doubles, or I don't know how much quantity it's plus. And, and that continuously, no? And what happens? It's the families that at the end have to pay for the fine. So at the end, it's like asylum violence, what we have, no? It's amazing that you have uh, such different policies or application of the, of, of, of the politics in, in, uh, in a problem, no? So I believe that it's better not to have people in jail. That's much better. But at the end, they're straining population and families and making, at the end, it's like woman affected, man affected, obviously, as well, no? But it's like a mass problem. The, there's like this data, I also gave it, that uh, eight in 10 fines of the new uh, security, citizen security law, uh, eight of every 10 in health, uh, in health are about cannabis. That's loads of money, loads of money at the end of the year. So they don't have interest in changing anything. So I believe that, yes, it's in, in, we can empower women to be in companies and to 
to make pushing that these companies uh, make visible the, the necessity of, of, of uh, making women's push up for everything. But at the end, it's like we have to see what happens in every place, in every country, and, and revert it all together, all the women together, no? So, well, I believe that like, all the policies in every country are complicated. <laughs> It's a clear indication why we have to continue working to change drug policy. Um, the collateral damage will never allow us to reach the sustainable development goals of no poverty, gender equality, um, you know, zero hunger. Um. I also think that um, one of the underlying things is why why women are. Uh, quite oftentimes left behind is uh, stigma related directly to the visual of a woman lighting a spliff. You know, with a man it might look cool, it might look hippie, it might look, oh look there's a stoner, but there's a sp special type of stigma attached to women uh, actually consuming cannabis. Okay, women can eat a cookie or something, that's fine. But with a big fat spliff, no, that's not so okay. You know, that's why I've got my feminized weed shirt on today. Um, because we also love to consume cannabis, you know. Uh, we also just like to get high. We're not always medicating ourselves for some sort of a condition or, or something that's justified. We don't have to justify our use of cannabis. I love to wake and bake. <laughs> so we don't we know that the whole thing that Patty was saying about the cannabis hostess really this is the 21st century the sort of tits and ass chicken and weed leaf bikini thing doesn't really work for us either so that's on the one side, we're using uh, cannabis in a sort of objectifying way to promote your product is kind of not cool anymore. But at the same time, we want to sit there on the couch with our packet of chips and our spliff and our TV series um, and, 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 and not be criticized. So how do you think we can use media and 21st century technology to get are over that stigma of us actually consuming cannabis. You know, that's amazing. I mean, we will never reach gender equality if companies objectify women to sell their products. Just keep that in mind as you're developing your corporate sustainable development policies. Uh, well, I, I mean, I think that that's a great point. Women love to use cannabis, and we, in the United States, we live in a nation where everyone likes to be messed up on something, and it's socially acceptable to have something that's mommy's little vodka cup or mommy's nighttime Xanax or whatever the things are that are being promoted in pop culture, and cannabis use in women is not really promoted in pop culture that much. And when you watch TV and you see in these sitcoms and in these movies, the stoner is typically a young, dumb male, white male, typically. And they are, um, you know, they don't really speak to us. It's funny if we, you know, eat our bag of chips and smoke a spliff and watch the movie, we'll laugh with it. But it doesn't really reflect that how many women in how many households are smoking a joint at the end of the day so that they can be more present in their body, so they can relax from the afternoon, so that they can just enjoy their evening. And I think that once we start talking about it, what happens is we learn that we were hiding it from the same lady who was hiding it from us, who was hiding it from the doctor, who was hiding it from the nurse. And once we kind of start to talk about it, um, it goes away. And so I think that this time, this momentum that the whole world is having right now with cannabis and cannabis use is, um, is just one more step for that equality. And you know, as women, we are disadvantaged because we want to protect our children 
and we want to protect the sanctity and the safety of our families. And even yesterday, the Boys, of, Boys and Girls Club, which is like a YMCA program where um, youth, especially rural and underprivileged youth, can go and have a basketball gym and have courses and have things that they can do in the afternoon. Um, one of the YMCA's put out a notice that said if the parent showed up to pick up their child and smelled like cannabis, that they would be reported to the child welfare services. And this was in a legal state where they were allowed to consume cannabis. And so as a woman, now those moms are what, maybe going to not send their kids to the YMCA? Or, you know, how are they going to deal with this, even if they don't think they smell like smoke or whatever? The perception that you might smell like smoke is going to now trickle down through those kids and through that community unless we stand up and say, sorry, we have a right to do this. Um, I thought um, a lot of time about the self-stigmatization because it's not so easy to be a woman and consume cannabis without self-stigmatization. And uh, women who are mothers, uh, cannabis consumers and mothers, they are double stigmatized, yes. Um, I think it's a um, big issue to work on that and it's um, a philosophical problem too, I think. Uh, so um, we must work on that and um, yeah, I, I am, yeah, I think when another thing, it's um, how women are represented in the, in the media uh, as uh, consumers. And we saw men who, who are uh, in, in, in contact with cannabis or they are bosses, yeah, there are uh, big uh, players and so on, yeah, and if a woman, woman is uh, uh, smoking, she is a prostitute or another, yes, uh, that th this is what we see in the media, there are not the ladies and that had the big uh, uh, power, no. Or they're not capable of being good parents, yeah. they're, they're not, you know, able to take care for their children. Exactly, exactly, so I think uh, that's a, a thing where we must uh, think about, but uh, it's in, in not in, yeah, in, in, in too many countries in Germany, I saw and I see a big discrimination to the Canafems too. Uh, so I think uh, we must uh, make a big effort uh, to uh, bring the the Canafems uh, uh, forward. Yes. Uh, so when we see here the uh, people who are sitting here, how many are women? Uh, yeah, it's not so much. Can you? Yeah, 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 yeah okay, okay, okay. Yeah, good, good. Uh, maybe, we, maybe we should all make a pact to change our social media profiles to smoking a big spliff or a bong or something. <laughs> um, uh, I, 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 my, in my opinion, society expects women to be mothers. We came here to bring childhood alive, and and when your relationship being mother, when you, you make the relation of mother and cannabis, uh, society goes with its hands in the head. And I'm not speaking about fathers or mothers. I'm speaking about people of my age, people that consume cannabis, and they can see you face to face and say, but once you give birth, you will still Stop. keep smoking? And it's like such a question that sometimes you're embarrassed to, to answer it, no? So at the end, I think we believe that the, um, mothers and women have the double stigma of being mother and consumers, and it's like that. It's a fact. So there's this, uh, da uh, this data from the National Drug Plan in Spain that it says that from 18 to 36, the consume in women goes down in, in the, in the, when they make the answers in the inquiries. Yeah? Uh, I believe that many women don't say the truth when they answer this, this, these inquiries. No, these surveys. Uh, it's, um, 
we are still with the self-stigma, you said, and it's very difficult to go out of that because I, I don't know in your countries, but in Spain, if they discover that you've been using cannabis during your pregnancy, uh, they have these protocols. Uh, they have this pro sorry these protocols where they uh, can take the baby from yourself just when you give birth. So more violence than that, I can't imagine it in this world apart from other big violences. But to the woman, no. So from our organization, we are uh, making like a fax uh, in our website. We are working on that to give information for mothers that. Are being uh, are suffering the protocols of the social security of health uh, to see if we can at least give them uh, answers to their questions because it's very difficult to find uh, information on the networks or anywhere. No, so at the end, I believe that uh, it's it's very difficult that media adapt themselves the discussion or the the, the no the yeah the, the the message because it it goes on 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 to them like in negative no so it's very difficult to make the change it's funny because i saw you up here earlier breastfeeding your baby and and that's such a a natural typical moment um, and then from the American culture it's totally unacceptable it's something that you should be ashamed of doing even though it is the sustenance of life that um, many you know want to protect life um, and then another interesting thing that I think of is that we know now for a fact that breast milk contains endogenous cannabinoids and so we have no problem representing the fact that once a woman has breastfed her baby and the baby is all like, ah. <laughs> we don't have any problem calling that baby milk drunk. Yes. Do we? We, we? we have no problem associating an infant child to an alcohol intoxication. But when in fact that child is not drunk, it's cannabinoid content. <laughs> so let's think about that the next time we see a baby feeding. <laughs> It is not milk drunk, it's cannabinoid consent, and I'd like to see us move forward with that thought from here forward, and maybe some of the stigmatization that women can't be good mothers while consuming cannabis is a falsity, because they've been producing cannabinoids since the beginning of time. So, and at this point, I'd like to open up the floor. Does anybody have any questions for our panelists? I know in our first panel, I didn't have time for that, so I want to open it up. And if not, we're totally capable of keeping talking. <laughs> anybody? Linda Hendry, uh, Legalized Cannabis Campaign, Scotland. It's our experience in the UK that cannabis legalization is being held back by these photographs of women and men smoking because people don't realize that you can eat it and drink it, have it in a yogurt, so it doesn't have to be smoked. I'm not sure how the USA got round the stigma of smoking, but somehow they managed in a way that the UK is not managed to yet, irrespective of whether you're male or female. Um, yes, I think sometimes uh, we, we slip up a little bit with the language uh, and we say oh, smoking uh, cannabis instead of, you know, watching every word. So I just apologize for that, that we should always just say consuming cannabis, which can be in a myriad different ways of consuming cannabis. So um, maybe to leave smoking out of it is, yes, yes, a good idea. Um, I don't, I don't believe that smoking should be that stigmatized if, if it's not mixed with tobacco. So it's the minutiae of the language that's really important. Um, so thanks for bringing that to our attention. Yeah. Um, my name is Ilya Reznik. I'm a coordinator of Israeli Association for Medicinal, Medicinal Cannabis. 
and I, I also am a representative or uh, advisor for Israeli parliament for cannabis issues. We had a lot of problem because our Ministry of Health revoked uh, licenses from young women pregnant because just because of their pregnancy, not because of the side effects and not because of, of uh, adverse events, but just become, because they were healthy enough to make their partnership, to make their marriage, and uh, they uh, lucky they are, uh, they uh, became pregnant, and they just revoked their licenses without any obvious reasons. So we, we uh, needed to change this practice. We had two years struggle together with women organizations, and we changed it finally. This next, last year, the uh, Ministry of Health uh, uh, made some conference and uh, uh, agreed that uh, each woman that would, would like to have a medical cannabis uh, sustainable uh, for, uh, for the whole period of the pregnancy will not be taken out her uh, license to use cannabis in each form for, with a suppositorium, uh, inhalation, uh, 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 sublingual drops. It will be allowed under the some uh, agreement with her that uh, with, she will never uh, sue the Ministry of Health for unexpected uh, circumstances, and it was allowed, but it, it had it us three years of a huge struggle, but we changed the policy, and that now Israeli women are able to continue their pregnancy uh, with uh, having cannabis uh, with them. Thank you. It's a real problem in Colorado. I just wanted to kind of tell, because you said you were from Israel, that um, I just want to shout out Israel for leading the world in actual clinical studies with cannabis, and that as women, I would just love for Israel to come forward with some clinical studies and clinical trials for women in pregnancy and breastfeeding with cannabis, because we right now rely on studies that are anecdotal and our own experience, and we rely on studies from Jamaica. And, um, and I just, I feel like the next, there is no next step with pregnancy and women because it's so sensitive without some sort of research-backed data. And um, so I'm just, hey, if you got another project, <laughs> that's the next one you can work on. Hi. Yo, oh, I have to stand up. I got up at 5.30 in the morning, so I don't know. If I... <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Gabi from ENCODE. And uh, what you anchored, that's the European Coalition for Just and Effective Drug Policies. It's actually 25th anniversary this year. So. <laughs> Not mine, <laughs> but the organizations. So, uh, well, what you said about, Patti, what you said about the fairs and the bikini girls, yes? Uh, I don't mind see half naked, they are always painted or something, these bikini girls, they freeze their, you know, what off when they go outside. This is not my issue. Uh, I mean, you could also have cute boys there and uh, would be the same, but my problem with all that is if you go to fairs and to events, it's like all big business party scenes, you know? And it's just making money, and how do you sell, you know, with these girls swinging their boobs and whatever. And what, what these businesses always forget is that they are where they are because there's activists fighting, you know. And the activists all fight, you know, this whole conference here and everything. People are working. They are working really hard. They don't get paid for it. They do it because they are really motivated, yeah. So this is already, you know, you go to a trade fair, it's a trade fair, so they want to sell something, and that's it. But I think this is a really good opportunity, because I already saw yesterday, there are many, many women. And we in ENCOT, we had this general assembly in, in September, and we reorganized, and now I'm happy to inform you, we are four women in the executive committee and one man. And life got much more, much easier ever since that. So I think this is a good opportunity to be here. We should form like an international female organization, right? So we are all here, so we could do it right now. Huh? Okay. Thank you.
Um, anybody else out here? Okay. Um, well, I just wanted to say, yeah, it, obviously, a woman can go to the fair as they want. Uh, they are working. Uh, but as you said, it would be nice as well to see some men doing that. At least for me, it would be really nice. Um, and, and it's not happening. <laughs> well, if afterwards some of you want to be our hostesses, you can. But it's not about that. I'm, I'm not looking equality in, in that thing. The thing is, like, there are women in the fairs, and they are, myself or my, ex, my, my own experience, I'm from Barcelona. I've been going to Spanavis many years since I was, like, really young. Um, and there were always women in the fairs, but our, our, uh, you would say that there were women that were croppers, 80%, no? Um, we buy, and you go to the fair, and you go with your boyfriend or with your friend, and when you go there, they speak to him. Mm -hmm. They don't speak to you, and maybe you are the one that starts buying. So it's not that I don't mind that people go naked and sell seeds, but it's not for me. I'm not going to buy you seeds if you sell it like that, because it's not motivating. <laughs> I mean, no? So it's not about the naked woman. It's about how industry uses the, the image of woman in the cannabis industry, no? Um, obviously, they are paid. They can do whatever they go. Uh, when you see them there, they are pretty happy, most of them. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really conscious that people also need money. <laughs> and so, I am, um, no, it's, it's about that. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, little by little, cannabis industry is uh, getting aware that we are lots of women in the states who have a uh, woman grow, no? Um, and I imagine that at the end it has to be modified. I'm an activist. I don't mind about what industry does, a uh, part of the way that they affect in the activism, no? So they can go on. I just want to add to something on that. We just talked about women incarcerated. We cannot, you know, w when we reflect on the objectifying of women, and I, and I agree, women have the right to earn incomes. And if they want to objectify themselves as women, that's okay. In the same time, I hope that those same women realize that women have been engaged in illegal trafficking, sometimes against their will, sometimes as a result of sexual, uh, a human trafficking for sexual exploitation. And if we're gonna reach the sustainable development goals, we still, even as women, have to acknowledge that other women um, have been taken against their will and put into positions that they didn't prefer to be if they weren't impoverished. So I wanna, do you wanna add to that or? I, I would like to say something about this because um, the matter is that maybe we have never been considered like a consumer, you know? So nobody care about the, how to marketing the product, the cannabis, for, for a woman. So maybe we can change right now, now on, you know, to, to say that I am <laughs> a woman. I would like to use cannabis in very many different ways, but I, want, I don't want to buy it on the way you buy. So I need help. I need that somebody advise me, give me the right advice, because we need it. We, have, uh, we are women having a period, uh, you know, <laughs> and we need it more than men, maybe. But, you know, nobody advises. I think that's true. I think that's an economic perspective. We've been talking a lot about social justice issues here, but the economic perspective from simply economics, women control the majority of household spending. Women make the, make the purchases in health food stores. Women control the health care of the household. And so from a purely economic perspective, a male CEO or a man, you know, business owner who's coming into this new cannabis industry today is going to completely overlook the largest consumer that hasn't even been marketed to. And so it is changing and it will change. Um, but especially if we get women in positions of leadership and positions of CEO and positions of power in the business space. And that comes back to resources. Resources, um, often men, investment 
men that are putting investments in the legal cannabis industry will not invest in women. They will invest in someone who looks like them. And, you know, if you look at the dollars and cents, it's a bad decision because just like you said, there are women who are waiting to be marketed to. Hello. Hi. Thank you all for being here. This has been so inspiring. I'm coming from Vancouver, Canada. My name is Caitlin Hurley. Um, my practice is in uh, providing street-level access to cannabis for harm reduction. And my question um, is around looking for advice um, for staying grounded in grassroots values while actively participating in the government legalization process and corporate business practices, which can sometimes feel like a tug of war from an identity perspective. If any of you care to speak to that? Yeah, for sure. So um, the question is looking for advice to stay grounded uh, in grassroots values while actively participating in the government legalization process and corporate business practices that come along with that, which can feel like an identity tug of war, often particularly as a woman. I think, I think I understood. Um, I come from an organization that it's purely men, but uh, I'm the president of the organization. Um, I, it's the Cannabis Association Federation in Catalonia. And we worked uh, also in the state level, but I want to speak about the, the act in Catalonia. We pushed uh, for have a proper law uh, in cannabis uh, regulation about the CCCs. Uh, and we had the opportunity to being women, the ones that are inside the organizations, even though they're purely uh, masculine, but they have all of them like a key woman, no? We, we tried to push in the law and make some vocabulary changes and stuff like that. We could make it, but at the end, when you had the law, in your hand when we had it, even though the state uh, now just pushed out our law and we don't have any, any t uh, now again. The first page was all just thought for men. The proper name of the law, para uh, usuarios, it's like uh, users in masculine. Uh, it never referred uh, to any, any kind of feminine or gender way, no? Only in the first page you had three aspects that they were only for men. So uh, our organization, REMA, it also has the objective to go inside the laws and make this change and this gender point of view. And you need to be together. You need to be together and to make yourself listen, get some people that are inside the organizations, uh, get to know them, get to speak to them, no? So my advice is, Get, a, get a, a big group of women that are inside places working and try to make the, from the grassroots, but inside the organization to push for it. Because it's very difficult, even though you do it. I think when it comes to staying grounded, um, I, know, I know exactly what you mean. And I think um, sharing, sharing absolutely everything that you do with your sisters, and uh, we can use uh, social media, we can use all sorts of things, small meetings, that type of thing, but when you speak about something and not keep it all in your head, that's a really good way to keep yourself grounded and keep moving forward so you don't get stuck. So I think, um, I think we have two more questions, the gentleman over this. Okay, um, three more. One, okay, two, yeah, three. I just uh, want to say as a black male, I've had zero negative experiences since 1985 with any women in any deal I've ever done. And then as cannabis became sort of normal, the white male dominated culture of cannabis, especially run by the so-called liberal hippies, was worse than any racism I've ever experienced with anybody else. So that's changing. Um, just on a quick note, the incarceration rates for men in the states are going down. For women, they are going up. Um, and uh, thirdly, I just wanted to bring attention to this awesome comic book. I just did an interview with these incredible Italian activists, and they have this comic book 
um, from the perspective of a grandmother teaching kids about hemp, and they bring these things into schools. It has a hemp seed in it, and they have the kids bring it home and plant the project with their family, and it's just an incredible thing. And I asked them, you know, why they um, did that, and they said, in Italy, the grandmother is revered and respected, and we just love to get more grandmoms and women generally into this racket. So um, that's all I had to say. And yeah, if they could stand up, and she's right there. Uh, hello, I'm Humberto Nogueira, uh, representing Portugal and Angola. Um, well, uh, I heard here that uh, the importance of women because uh, breast milk has uh, endocannabinoids. But in, in my cannabis reading since 2011, I found something curious that uh, nine months before, an endocannabinoid named Anandamide, uh, his, uh, his um, availability uh, in the in, uh, women's uh, uterus is responsible for the body to accept or reject the, I don't know, embryon. So we all, we all own that to our mothers because their endocannabinoids were enough in their uterus for us to be here present. Uh, with all this, uh, it's not a question, it's like, uh, I would like to ask you women uh, in the industry, uh, women that consume cannabis, please educate other women um, to consume uh, cannabis foods, hemp foods, uh, more, the more cannabinoids they can because that's the simplest way to avoid um, uh, involuntar involuntary abortion. So please, uh, educate other women on, on that. There's a condition uh, called uh, endocannabinoid uh, deficiency. Uh, so please educate women on, on consuming, so improve their bodies and have healthier babies. We'll take these, the three in the front. We're going to give everybody a chance. Okay. Beautiful. Hello, everyone. My name is Luke uh, from Let It Hemp. Uh, I'm backgrounded in uh, social work and anthropology. Um, just a very quick remark to my uh, brown brother here. He said there are less people incarcerated in the US. It is true, less males are incarcerated, but um, less white males. There's a higher amount of uh, South Americans and black people being put in jail. And this after legalization of cannabis. And I think, and I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one here, but I think this is a scam. This is not what people were hoping about. Um, it's still a reason to discriminate people. And I think we have to talk about this too. Uh, nevertheless, um, back on your um, presentation, thank you so much. We have talked, or you have talked about um, uh, business also from the, from the female side. Um, I would like to know where do you see the potential of re-implementing values into and especially into the cannabis industry um, and what do you think about its potential if this is done especially by women? I think that all of us sitting here up on the stage just have to keep on doing what we're doing. <laughs> you know, um, uh, in, our, in our very full lives. And if, if, if anybody comes across a specifically uh, woman-centered cannabis organization or a product or, a, um, or a, a, a regulation that you particularly like that is framed somewhere in the world around women, please share it with all of us. Um, it's really just about uh, keeping on and trying to do the best that we can do. Yeah, I say looking at other businesses and looking to do business with other businesses that have women in position of leadership. Uh, in the working role, we are, we're equally represented, 50%, 50% women. And as you get into the CEOs or into the C-suite, it goes way down. And so one easy thing you can do when you're going to make a business deal is look to see, does that business have 
a woman in a position of power or a woman in their leadership. And if they do, chances are you're going to be more successful working with that company, and that will continue getting more women in those positions of power. Hi. I've, <clears throat> I've traveled to um, a lot of expos, and the common thread running through everything is education. And there's a really simple way of doing it. If you put a chart on the wall, different colors represent different cannabinoids. And it's also a way of getting around the pharmaceutical. If the hemp producers put a little tag on the back that shows CBD content, um, different terpenes, etc., and the values, you can match that to the chart on the wall. And it's a way of avoiding, avoiding the law and avoiding um, the pharmaceutical. You can just do it really simply, not mention these things on the packaging. But it comes down to education. And cannabis is called Mary Jane. It's the mother. And it's the mothers that will educate the children and the men around them if these charts are put up. But it's something that needs to be organized with the likes of yourself, um, the international hemp growers, people like that to bring simple therapy and wheels out and just stick them on the back of a product. You don't have to mention cannabis. You don't have to mention CBD. There's just a simple wall chart there, or you can download it on your phone. Look at the product, bang, you know what's in it. And education is the key, and it's the common thread through every expo I've been at. And fair play to you. Easy done. <clears throat> Very quickly, I'm from New Zealand, from Christchurch specifically, and <clears throat> while my name is Blair Anderson, I also am a, particip a participating member of a lot of organisations, uh, not just what I do. But one of the things I just want to inform you guys about is we've got to be very careful about the images that we do portray, and particularly around women. Um, there is a very good one that appeared on a billboard in, in um, Colorado of a reclining, bikini-clad, um, probably around 18, 19-year-old girl. And, of course, when I showed this to somebody, I was a sexist for clearly showing this, except underneath it was written, no carbs, no violence, and no hangover. Now, that's a public health message directed at the very at-risk group that we should be addressing it to. And whatever it did, it certainly communicated that. So we've got to be very careful about being judgmental about the, the, the images. The second thing I want to talk about is, while the research in New Zealand is very robust around this, we have two studies, one a multidisciplinary study and one a longitudinal study. They are gold standard. They've been tracking the longitudinal um, people in my city, Christchurch, on a uh, uh, 37 years now, and the data is indicative of the very arguments that we've got here, that the figures for this particular study are, can be uh, applied right across New Zealand. The data is that 80% of childbearing age adults in New Zealand have smoked cannabis more than five times we can largely you know, derive from that, they enjoyed it, <laughs> right? Now that suggests to me that we've got over a gender gap when it comes to the consumption of cannabis because it's 50-50. That's, that's New Zealand. We smoke more than Jamaica, apparently. So there is a lot to be learned from the data and, and, and arguably um, we've got some things right in New Zealand around that. At least there is equal, equality in use. We were the first country to give women the vote it seems we're the first country to give women the toke. We're going to allow one last question because we want to end on time. One minute. Hi. I'll keep it short and sweet. Hi, um, my name is Sagar. My interest is with regards to, we have all these uh, women's rights marches last few years in the UK or wherever, in the US. But then on the flip side, um, I see all these chemical-laden products sold to all of us, but, you know, since I'm talking about women's marches, so then I asked a few of my friends that we're talking about ecology and everything. You're told that, okay, women's marches, great. You know, um, but then look at the complicity of the very people that are saying yes, campaigning for your rights. You're also being sold the most chemical-laden products, whether it's to do, put it, wherever on your body, inside or outside. 
and um, especially just a focus. Um, so I have a condition which has been since I was seven years old, it's arthritis. And I thought it was okay, joint related. But then speaking with my mother, asking her when something might have changed. And she says, when you were seven years old. I says, what happened when I was seven? She says, oh yeah, I remember when you were seven years old, you go into junior school, you all had to go and have vaccines. I was like, seriously? Oh yeah, of course. But no, it can't be connected. I looked at the symptoms of vaccines. I tick off every single one, except for the ones which might be applicable to women. So my question here is, firstly, since this is about women, we need to start having holistic open conversations about when we are saying to campaign for women's rights and then we are completely duplicit in actually selling them the products for which they probably need to go and have more weed in the first place then, because they need to clean up their system. Secondly, just last week, the Italian government tore up the whole health ministry, chucked it out, because a year ago, uh, last year and this year, a million people marched in Milan or somewhere in Italy to campaign against vaccines. So that's another thing which is another abuse, not of just all of us, but of especially of uh, women, because then what happens to the DNA of if you have a baby? And um, so I just wanted to get your thoughts on that, especially when Italy is the first country to actually be brave enough to actually challenge this with, with enough evidence. And I'd just like to add that the main person who's most prolific in putting out evidence for against vaccines is Robert F. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And he's very prolific on these issues. But in terms of women's rights issues, um, these issues, and also the other thing I just wanted to ask is, is there any impact on the body or connection between the vaccines and how cannabis could be cleaning up a lot of the problems it's conflated? Thank you. Well, you've asked a lot of, um, you've asked a lot of questions that are, are certainly weighing on a lot of women's minds, that's for sure. We're not here to talk about vaccines, though. We're here to talk about how we can empower our women. But do meet with me afterwards. I, would, I, I have some thoughts, some private thoughts on the vaccines. Um, I don't know how I can bring that into cannabis. So I think we're just going to close right now. I'm not to ignore, but you do broach some very thought-provoking um, ideas. Well, let's go ahead and close it down so we can move into the next panel and keep things going so we can get out of here tonight. I want to thank all of you women. You're so beautiful, and I love you. And... Um, it's been amazing to serve with you. And Thank you. I think this panel was, we've been a bit exhausted, um, uh, Julian and myself, since we had our breakthrough judgment in September. And when we were leaving in the airport, um, I was thinking, oh, we've got to do this again and more work and more cannabis. But sitting here, I think that being on this women's panel has really been made the long journey worth it and meeting my lovely sisters and all other sisters in the, in the audience. So thank you very much and thank you for your contributions. Thank, thank you. you. We, uh, can all the women come here to the scenery and can we take a picture together? All the women. And then I also want to, I had a little closing comment because I Yeah, had hold on, it. hold on, hold on. Sorry. No, that's okay. I just wanted to bring it up. It was from the UN sec, Under Secretary General Michelle Bachelet. And it said, that's okay. Sorry. No, that's okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Sorry. It just says, when women are empowered and can claim their rights and access to land, leadership, opportunities, and choices, economies grow, food security is enhanced, and prospects are improved for current and future generations. And so that was their comment at the UN. And so I think if we switch that up to if women are not empowered, that's not the future we want. You know? There you go. That's an amazing way to close this today. Thank you. All the women, we want to invite all the women up here on the stage to come have a group photo with us.